All right, uh, good afternoon, uh, welcome. This talk is Signatures Are Dead, Long Live Resilient Signatures. My name is Daniel Bohannon. Uh, I'm an applied security researcher with FireEye. Um, prior to that, I spent several years doing incident response consulting with Mandiant. Um, and as the slide says, I'm obsessed with coffee and obfuscation. I'm Matthew Dunwoody. I'm senior security architect for Endpoint at FireEye. Uh, before that, I did applied security research and also spent several years doing IR at Mandiant as well. So Matt and I have worked together for several years now in, uh, in a lot of overlapping roles. Uh, and so this talk is really uh, comes from a place of uh, our responsibility working on a team to develop detections that we use in our incident response engagements, as well as what we use in our entire fleet of products across um, all of our service lines. Um, and so uh, it's been really uh, formative for us um, as we come up with um, detection ideas uh, and assumptions about things that we think maybe this is really unique and it'll be a great detection, and sometimes that ends up not not being the case. Um, and so uh, kind of the methodologies that we've developed and that we find helpful are what we're sharing with you today. And these are things that we use um, to build detections that we run across millions of endpoints um, and hundreds of networks, uh, sensors, uh, and have had uh, really honestly a lot of fun doing this and actually seeing it help uh, our customers and clients and actually catching evil. And so we want to share that with you guys uh, here today. So a brief outline, we're going to do just a quick background um, of kind of some of the, uh, uh, kind of an overview of some of the methodology that we'll be diving into. Um, and then we'll talk about the, the high level process of going about uh, methodology um, d detection, development, and uh, testing. Um, and then we'll look through a couple uh, case studies, looking at, um, at, at collecting, triaging, and coming up with detections for binary, uh, for uh, binary related malware, as well as some more um, kind of living off the land techniques um, um, like a register of an SCT scripts. Um, and as we go along, we'll be looking at, uh, at ways that we can break bad assumptions um, and looking at obfuscation and evasion and how we factor that in to our detection development. Um, and then we'll end with kind of, uh, kind of looking at holistically, um, where do we get input for these detection ideas and how do we kind of have that iterative cycle um, for ourselves personally as well as our overall team um, to continually make sure that we're staying on top of new attacker techniques. Um, and then we'll end with a few takeaways and have some time for questions. Um, so. First, the background. Uh, we have a lot of defer speak in this community, um, and there's a lot of terms that are used very interchangeably. Um, things like signatures, triggers, rules, IOCs, um, but they also have a lot of loaded meaning. So when you hear signature, you might think AV signature, or when you hear trigger, you might think real time versus historical, or when you think IOC, you may think just MD5s or something like that. Um, and so what we want to do is kind of set a blanket term of detection and say we're trying to find things that were not meant to be found, things that were concealed, um, and we want to make sense of what those are and have context to say, is this something I should be concerned about? Is this malicious? Is this interesting to me as a defender? Um, and this term for us in this talk today will cover both real time and historical. Um, we'll also cover uh, host and network. A lot of these, uh, the methodologies we'll be talking about do apply to both. Um, and we'll be uh, talking about these techniques from a language and tool agnostic perspective. Um, because again, a big part of our job is when we put in time to research a technique and a detection idea, then we want to get the most mileage out of that by translating that into various detection platforms. So, what is a signature? What is a, an indicator? What is a detection? Is it hashes? File names? IPs? Um, is it people's Twitter handles and comments of source code? Well, the answer is sometimes for all of these, right? How about a little exercise? Can you spot the bad signature here? On the left, we have a lot of uh, MD5 hashes. On the right, IP addresses, FQDNs. Well, the answer here is it depends, right? It, it depends on the context. Um, when we're scoping an, an active uh, incident, um, then we absolutely will use MD5s and IPs and FQDNs for scoping in that one environment, but those are things that can very easily be changed. And yes, some attackers do reuse infrastructure. Some will reuse uh, exact binaries. So hashes are still something that we look at. But if we have a hash for or a list of hashes in an IOC for one malware family, we dare not say that we can detect that malware family based on that alone. That would be naive. So we want to take a step back and be like, what are all the other opportunities we have to detect this thing? So when it comes to developing detections, we want to make sure that, that our input of what detections are 
um, isn't bad input, right? So again, a lot of people, when they hear the word IOC, they think, oh, it's just MD5s and IPs and FQDNs. And if that's the only IOCs you've ever seen, that's a logical conclusion to come to, but the reality is, is that it's so much more than that, and it really boils down to and or logic of any information you can put into it. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not putting our, ourselves in a detection uh, box, but that we can actually see all the available, uh, all the available data, and explore it accordingly. So who actually gets to define what a good signature is? Then, right? Some people say it is MD5s. Some people say it's not. Um, well, so when it comes to defining good signatures, I think it really depends in a lot of ways. It depends on the, the tooling you have available, but more importantly, what is the context? If you have a signature that fires, what, what context do you have to then take an actionable step with that signature? Because ultimately, it needs to make sense to the person who's looking at it so that they can take the next step to do what's best for them in their organization, in their environment, or for their customer. So good signatures. We want signatures that are more resilient than rigid. MD5s, IPs, those are rigid. Those can very easily be changed, but we really want to have a defense in-depth approach and, and attack uh, a, a malware family or a methodology from many different angles so that for an attacker to evade, they would have to evade every single one of those angles. Um, we also want more methodology-based than specific. We definitely do have very specific signatures and detections, but we want to have broad, uh, overarching detections as well. Uh, if nothing else, for the purpose of gathering information and identifying when attackers are changing certain pieces, and we can catch them step by step as they are evading um, their tools and their tradecraft. Um, and it's also more proactive than reactive. Definitely when we see brand new malware, then, oh man, we have to react and write detections for this new thing. But we can also be very proactive and staying on top of things that are released on Twitter and GitHub, but also doing our own internal research and learning from researchers and venues just like this to see what are the new topics that are coming down the pipe and what are the ways that we can start to explore available data to make sure that we're staying ahead before we actually see an attacker use this. And for that, there's a very specific process that we use, and Matt's going to share this with you now. Thanks. So talk you through kind of at a high level of the process, you know, this is really about kind of how we think about detections and, and what makes them good. And a big part of that is, is how we actually go about um, establishing these detections and thinking about them. So we're going to go through this at a little bit of a high level. So uh, walk you through kind of the steps that we take when we sit down to, to think about detecting something, whether it's from uh, defining those detections, working right down through getting example data, uh, testing what's already there, generating data that we can use to write our detections, actually writing them and then the whole testing and tuning process to get them to a point where we can actually productionize them. So uh, starting with defining the detections, the first thing to know is just what is it exactly that we want to look for? Is it some new malware family? Is it a new uh, technique that's been released on uh, Twitter like Squibbly-Doo was or some very broad methodology like using DNS for C2 which can be done in a lot of different ways and used by a lot of different actors? Uh, when defined it, do we want it in, in real time? Do we want this to be more of a historic thing, kind of scanning? versus uh, more dynamic. Uh, where do we want to find it? Do we want to, you know, on the endpoints, in the network, in our sim, in the sandbox, maybe preferably all of the above? And then uh, how do we want to find it? You know, what tools are applicable and available in our environment that we can leverage in order to identify uh, this thing that we do we want to find? And what signature formats are supported and, and best suited? There's so many signature formats out there now for these different mediums, for different tools, whether that's something like Snort, uh, Sim Queries, Yara, Yara with the additional modules like the PE module, which adds a lot of capability, uh, Open IOC, Sticks, Clam AV, Sandbox signatures, EDR signatures. There's so many different places, different ways that we can look for things. And it's, it's always really important, even at the outset, to start thinking about, based on what I know about this thing, where do I think this might be applicable, and where do I need to be uh, paying attention and focusing my efforts? Uh, and then also false positive tolerance. I mean, this is really going to define a lot about how my detections are going to work, because I need to know uh, what is the standard that I'm aiming for, what is the expectation that's going to come out of this? Is this something that I'm using on an engagement where I can have a much higher false positive rate and nobody's really going to mind, or is this something that's going into a product where every false positive a customer is going to be calling our company and complaining. 
beyond that, we need to uh, assemble a sample set. So this is just samples representing the thing that we want to write the detection for. And, and we can get these in a couple of different ways. The first being just collecting them. Uh, you know, for a malware family, this is going to be really the only way that we can do it for something that, that is an attacker created, uh, attacker in the wild malware family. But for other things, we can still collect examples while also generating others. So good examples of this would be things like the scriptlets. We can follow like the daily scriptlet hashtag and we can get lots of examples of what's being used in the wild and we can use those as, as part of our data set. But then we can also generate additional ones. We can use tools to, to generate new tools. We can bi run builders. There are a lot of builders out there for things like malware and, and scripts and tools. Uh, we can run obfuscators. We can develop new uh, variants based on these methodologies. And uh, Debo is going to run through kind of a, a couple of examples of, of what that looks like in the, the process of challenging those assumptions. And the goal here is to enumerate the entire problem set. So what is it that we're trying to detect in whole, not just a, a subset of those examples? And it's really important not to stop at the most common examples. I see a lot of instances where someone will release something on Twitter or release some new backdoor or whatever. People will start putting up detections for it. But a lot of times, there's a lot of assumption that the way that it was released is the way that it will be used and the only way that it will be used. And if uh, there's anything I've learned in, in my time doing IR is that attackers change everything. If you start making assumptions about how attackers are going to operate, they're going to eventually start changing those things. So it's very important to keep that in mind. Uh, then we're going to test the existing detections. Um, you know, sometimes they're free wins. Sometimes we'll just go in and we'll be able to see like, hey, some of my engines are already detecting this, but are all of them, are, are some of them, are they detecting all of the examples or just a subset? Uh, this can really help to focus the energy and, and focus where I'm going to pay attention and try to do my detection development to fill those gaps and to uh, kind of extend those detections from where they might be strong to where they're weaker. But also it can help me to adjust priority of existing detection. So I might find out that my uh, antivirus considers invoke mimicats to be generic .pwshell .ref a one b 61 fa 61 and and now I know that that's the thing that I didn't know before so when I see that that kind of um, opaque uh, definition name uh, pop up in my sim, maybe now I'm paying much more attention to that than I would have before. Uh, and of course, we're also going to try to do this uh, testing safely and outside of a prod environment so you, you know, we don't end up the subject of a spicy tweet uh, about our uh, OPSEC practices. Uh, once, I have, once I've gotten through that practice and I understand what I'm going to be working for, where I'm going to be building these detections based on what's already there, I'm going to generate data. That could be logs, that could be PCAP, that could be binary metadata, uh, that could be strings. It just kind of depends on, on what exactly I'm working towards, but I'm going to generate the data that I need for those, uh, for those detections. Then I'm going to actually start writing them. So I'm always going to start broad and tune down. It's much easier to, to work that way than it is to start narrow and try to expand. It also helps me to minimize the number of assumptions that I'm making on the rule. So if I start trying to work narrow, then I'm basically making assumptions about what I'm going to need to do in order to maintain my target false positive rate and, and be able to, to catch things. If I keep things very broad, then I'm working much more empirically. I'm seeing what's actually causing problems as opposed to assuming what's going to cause them. Um, I'm always keeping in mind, a lot of detections can be translated between types. So for instance, sometimes uh, YAR rules can make great snort rules. You know, they're, they're basically content searches. So there's more than one place that you can do that sort of thing. Uh, I'm always trying to uh, be mindful of and challenge the assumptions that I'm making bringing in. Uh, and I'm actively trying to bypass the methodology-based detection. So I'm not just writing these things and assuming that they're going to work. I'm trying to... Uh, look at what my detections hinge on and find ways to try to sidestep those. And that's, that's what uh, process that Debo is going to walk through. And we may need specific rules to capture specific cases. So it's not always that I can just make one rule per engine. Sometimes there are specific edge cases where I need to be looking for uh, different aspects of those that may not apply to the core of the technique. And, and we'll show kind of some of the examples of that. Uh, last, going to test uh, false negative testing against the sample set. Got to make sure I'm catching them all. Uh, FP testing against uh, legitimate data. Generally speaking, I'm going to start small, I'm going to tune, and I'm going to scale up. Uh, continuing to work through that process, retesting uh, against the samples to validate the tuning once I'm done. Make sure that during that tuning process, I didn't change something inadvertently that has affected the outcome of my uh, detection. And I'm also going to uh, document any compromises I need to make in order to, to hit my false positive targets because it's important to know what impact that's going to have on the detection. Uh, and then I'm going to te also test against 
against new true positives that are identified during testing or deployment. You know, there's, if a uh, detection is good and a attack is common, most of the time we're going to find some examples of that attack in the wild. And maybe it hit on, you know, one of our detections that, that turned out, but does it hit on all of them? We've got to make sure that we still have the full coverage that we're looking for. So I'm going to do a kind of a, a walkthrough with this with binaries and you know why am I talking about binaries is 2018 everybody's talking about fileless malware but I can tell you in the wild that's just not the case uh, a lot of attackers still use a lot of, of binaries uh, and don't get me wrong they use a lot of living off the land tactics and fileless you know fileless uh, as well but there's also a lot of binaries still floating around out there uh, and at the end of the day AV is still not doing a great job with them most of the time AV signatures are lagging by anywhere from three weeks to a month behind the time that an AV company becomes aware of a sample. Uh, if they don't become aware of it, it will probably never have coverage. Uh, it's, it's very easy for attackers to change their malware. They have builders. They have uh, polymorphic malware. They're doing version updates too. They have their own software development cycle. Uh, and they're also able to test against those AVs, including the ML AVs. You know, they will just throw uh, binaries against the AV and they'll just keep trying until the AV misses it. And then that's the version that they'll go and use. So there's always bypasses for these, uh, especially when they're publicly available. Tools like VirusTotal have made this uh, process a lot easier for people. So by having my own signatures looking for these things, nobody's going to be able to test against them. Uh, I'm going to also val uh, validate the effectiveness of existing detection. So if I start through this process and what I find is that I don't need to do anything, then that's still a great day for me. I've validated that I have coverage uh, and I have you know, ensured that we're going to have a, a effective detection for these techniques. And there's also other things like intelligence gathering, VT, retro hunt, some other places where um, these kinds of detections can be used. So I'm really going to focus on writing these detections for binaries when I have an active intrusion, a high priority threat, or a prolific or publicly available malware. So these are things that I think are likely to affect my organization or have already affected an organization I'm working with, or uh, things that I know are eventually going to pop up in our high priority for my organization. Sometimes there are back doors that get announced on Twitter and I can just know that I'm going to see that thing within a few days. Like, so those just occur and so those are where I'm really going to focus on to make sure that we have that detection um, early and, and in as many places as possible. Uh, and also that we need additional context beyond it's bad. Uh, you know, ML is, is great at doing malware detection, but it's not great at giving a lot of context. So one of the things that can be really handy is if you have uh, additional detection capabilities for malware that you're particularly concerned about, being able to get that additional context that, oh, hey, not only is this thing bad according to the ML, but it is in fact APT28, then that gives me a whole lot more context than, hey, this is probably a coin miner. So an example of uh, defined detection here, you know, maybe I want to find all chopstick malware variants, just all of them, all, all the variants that have occurred, all the generations. Uh, I want to find them on the endpoint network and sandbox, historical in real time, and I'm going to do that using Yara plus uh, the PE module, uh, open IOC, snort, my SIM, my EDR, uh, and have uh, some false positive tolerance, we'll call it moderate. So the, the next step is going to be to go out and actually find these sample sets. And uh, I have the good fortune of working at a company that has an incredible amount of malware and intelligence. And so it is comparatively easy for me to actually collect up all of this data. But even without that, there's still a lot of other things. And I will still validate that we've gotten all of the good open source intelligence that's uh, applicable uh, to whatever threat I'm looking at. So there's a lot of ways that we can do that. So we can collect hashes from high confidence uh, sources. So, you know, thread intel feeds, blogs, public malware uh, repos, malware analysis reports. In my opinion, the reason that we give out hashes in our reports isn't so that you can go and look for those hashes, it's so that you can go and find that malware and then develop better detections based on that malware. Uh, so being able to go out and find those and get those samples in uh, is going to allow me to start to build out that sample set. And this is one of the places is where MITRE ATT&CK can be really helpful is that you can find for some of the more common and well-known malware families, you can start getting into like the references to those pages and you can start getting to the reports really quickly uh, and, and get a, a good reference uh, base started. Uh, I'll also try to find things on, on VTI and, and also using uh, some of the implant builders. It is definitely possible to get your hands on builders for some of these malwares if you want to and that can be very uh, valuable. 
for public malware, I'm going to generate representative samples. So I'm going to use multiple versions. If updates are available, go back through that uh, Git history and, and pull down some of the old versions to see what those look like. I'm going to generate variants for the significant options in a build. And this is basically things that are going to change the structure, behavior, or network comms of a piece of malware. So. Uh, for example, if I'm going to try to detect Cobalt Strike, I want to make sure that I'm looking very closely at things like the malleable profiles so that I can see what the different command and control is going to look like for all the default profiles as well as uh, for custom ones. Uh, and then I'm going to use common packers and obfuscators because if there's a public piece of malware out there and somebody's compiling it, somebody's going to throw it through some of the more common packers. And so if, if my entire detection is based off the assumption that nobody's going to do that, I'm not going to have a good day. Uh, then I'm going to test my existing detections, run PCAP through IDS, run the uh, binaries through the scanning engines, uh, test for the real-time and dynamic alerts, run in sandbox, and I'm going to see what comes out of that. What alerts have I generated? What data was generated as a result of that? You know, am I even generating the kind of data that I need in order to develop a detection, or is this kind of a, a, a dead end? And then I'm going to figure out, like, stop here or continue. Do I need to develop all of the detections I plan? Do I need to only develop a fraction of them and kind of keep working from there? Uh, then I'm going to collect, uh, generate my actual data from this. So I'm going to collect dynamic execution reports. This might be from sandboxes. There's online sandboxes. There's vendor sandboxes. There's Kaku and different open source tools, uh, malware reports and blogs, these different sources. Uh, I'm going to grab some PCAP captures. I'm going to try to get some process memory and strings out of those. Uh, I'm going to parse the binaries using tools, so things like PE Explorer, CFF Explorer, SigCheck, Floss, which is a great tool, which uh, not only grabs strings, but also stack strings, which can be really valuable if you're doing memory-based detection uh, and any kind of vendor analysis engine that I have. Ideally what I want is to be able to get the exact output that I'm going to be using to match against. So if I can get the same data in the same format that I need to write the uh, tool, the detections against, that's going to give me uh, the highest fidelity when I'm going through and trying to work with actually developing the uh, detection. Then I'm going to go through and kind of group samples a little bit. Uh, a lot of times, especially with some of these malware families that are more prolific, have been around for a long time, you're going to have um, some differences between them. So you can't always put them into uh, a single detection rule. So I'll, I'll break those up. I'll also look for outliers. Even when working with like high confidence sources, there's always a decent chance that something's going to end up in there that shouldn't be in there. So going through and just looking for those outliers and kicking them out before, um, before I get too far down the road. Uh, then I'm going to focus on writing my detections. So there's a lot of different aspects of binaries that are useful beyond things like hashes. So there's the probably most common ones like strings and the hex strings, which you're going to use for typical YAR rules. But then there's a lot of other aspects of files and binaries that you can use, especially with things like the PE module in Yara or something like OpenIOC. So you can start looking at things like the authentic code signatures. Does have a bad signature? Uh, imports and exports. Uh, import hashing is great, but uh, I've actually seen attackers that appear to be changing import hash as part of their builder. So they actually seem to add and remove imports just to mess with the import hash. So um, not always something you can 100% rely on. It can be better to actually look at the specific imports. Uh, and exports can be really valuable. Sections and non-section data version info. So uh, on Windows, PEs contain internal version information. That can be very valuable as well. Uh, there's entire malware families that I can identify because they use the wrong registered trademark Unicode symbol in their Windows, uh, Microsoft Windows internal version thing. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do there. Also looking at if something's claiming to to be service host in, in the internal version info? Is it three times the size of any ever released version of service host? There's lots of like methodology based detections that you can use using these, um, these attributes. Uh, same with resources. If somebody's using the same icon in a lot of their malware, you can look for that. Export names, um, things like export name and export timestamp. A lot of attackers uh, seem to overlook that when they're, build and they're making their builders. Um, maybe they don't realize uh, things like the PE timestamps will tend to get stomped, version info will get changed, some of those things, but the export timestamp and export name on DLLs tends to get overlooked for whatever reason. Uh, also different PE characteristics in there as well. Is there a DLL or an EXE? Are there anomalies in the, the executable? Uh, dynamic execution items, persistence, um, memory artifacts like mutexes and name pipes, command and control, um, config files or registry keys and potentially handles to those in memory. 
Um, strings that are decoded in memory, uh, a, lot of ma uh, a lot of good binaries don't really have a lot of usable strings uh, based on the fact that they're uh, packed, but they'll do a lot of like stack strings and string decoding in memory. Um, injection into known processes, it's literally anything that the tools that are available to me will support, I'm going to try to enumerate all of that data and look at it and look at the common elements from those items as the starting point. And the idea here is that if it detects all of the known versions to date based on those common elements, it increases the likelihood of, chance, uh, of uh, catching future versions. So I'm not trying to detect only what's come before, I'm trying to like, look forward a little bit, look at the core of this malware family and figure out you know, what's likely to, to, to come next. And this can increase my false positives, but it can also allow me to capture uh, future versions even before they're, they're actually built. Um, I'm going to use behavioral detections where possible. I'm going to incorporate both the structure of the malware and the attacker TTPs in deploying and using it. So all of those persistence and uh, other aspects to actually running and using the malware. Uh, I'm going to add in those weak detections like hashes and domains. I mean, even though I don't get much value out of them, I'll, I'll say in the last three years I did incident response, I saw maybe half a dozen MD5 hits um, across I don't even know how many actual incidents. Uh, and I'm going to make my signatures as broad as possible and detect in as many ways as possible while staying in that FP rate. So, you know, I'm going to try to detect as, as many of the aspects of it and, and in as many places as possible. Then I'm going to run it uh, against the sample set, against clean systems, against corpus of binaries, uh, test environment, production test. I'm going to review those hits and update for both true positives and false positives. I'm going to keep iterating. So now uh, Daniel's going to walk through uh, specific examples and kind of enumerating those assumptions and, and challenging detections. All right, thanks, Matt. So yeah, there's a ton of information in binaries that we may not necessarily immediately think of. And in some ways, when you think about detecting a process execution like register of 32, which we're going to look at, uh, it may seem like, well, there's not really nearly as much complicated information to go off of. But what I would say, this is where context becomes really important. And there are still a lot of assumptions um, that we as defenders um, make. And as we discover ways to break those assumptions, then we like to share those with the community so that we can all improve and get better together. <clears throat> So a uh, quick level, uh, quick high level overview, RegSurf32 native Windows signed uh, binary. Um, it, it's a really awesome um, app whitelisting bypass discovered by Casey Smith or Sub T back in 2016. Um, I remember the day that he tweeted it out. I was still drinking my morning coffee, uh, wrote a network a detection for it. And before lunchtime, we were already seeing it being used. Happened really fast. And really good attackers really like Casey Smith and Matt Nelson and other people on Twitter. So when certain people tweet, you got to listen up and look for it quickly because we see attack adopting them very, very quickly. Um, but essentially, you can use RegServe32 to execute a local or remote SCT file. And inside of that, you can put any uh, JScript, VBScript, and several other languages, which we'll see in a second. So whenever we look at something that we want to detect, we have to step back and say, do I understand the, the execution, uh, the, the attack cycle? And then each step of the way, what are my detection opportunities? What are the artifacts I have access to that I can parse? What are the tools I have for real-time and historical detection on both the network and the endpoint? So this is uh, the, the kind of the POC that Casey released. You have the command on the right, which is pointing to, in this case, a remote SCT file, which is what we see on the left, just a, a simple XML file. And we're going to look at both of these pieces, starting with the command. So now maybe we're going to come up with a detection, which we see on the left. So and logic, if we see these four combinations of strings on the command line, or heck, even in you know, service arguments, run keys, or anywhere in registry, this could be really interesting, um, then this would detect this command. However, we want to start uh, taking this simple example, which this is like an example you may see in some of like, like the atomic testing frameworks, which is really a good first step. But we want to make sure that we don't stop there and say, yeah, we detect squibbly do, we detect RegServe32, because there's a lot of components that can be changed that we want to make sure that we're doing iteratively. One of those being slashes. In HTTP, for RegServe, you can change forward slashes and backward slashes when it uh, comes to that URL. This is dependent on the binary. Uh, so for example, PowerShell can take both forward slashes, both backward, or forward back, backward forward. So any binary I'm looking at or any detection I'm writing where a URL is present, I will immediately go and flip those around and see if it's possible. Because if it is, I want to account for that in my detections. 
Um, next, we have uh, uh, Red Server will support HTTP, HTTPS, so we want to make sure we're not hard coding that into our detection. And it actually supports a lot more FTP, Web Dev Server, it also supports local files as well. And so this is an instance where I might say, okay, maybe I'm going to at this point divide into two detections and handle Red Server for local SCT and for remote SCT separately so I don't overcomplicate one detection. And this is a theme we'll see. We're going to start peeling off multiple detections to detect these things, as well as at the end also have like a reverse detection to say an S, a, a red surf command that doesn't match any of these things to have a, a methodology to then uh, immediately know when something doesn't match all the things that we've taken into account so far. Um, another thing, a lot of people love to copy and paste, myself included, because it's easy. But when people release POCs, a lot of attackers copy and paste, and they don't take the time to think about why does this work and what do all of these things mean. So for example, these arguments S and U, most people leave these with a single white space between every argument right at the beginning of the command. But you can actually reorder them. So I want to make sure I'm looking at them separately in my detection. Um, you can also put them all over the place, right? So in this case, slash s is now at the very end of the command, um, which is interesting. We'll see that in a second. But why don't we just run red serve help? What do these mean? Are they all necessary? For example, slash m, help menu for red serve says, you must use this with the slash i command. However, you really don't. <laughs> just remove it. Does the command still work? Heck yes, it works. So an attacker doesn't have to use it. So I don't want that in my detection. I'm going to get it out. Um, in addition, uh, slashes, when you look at arguments, um, PowerShell will use the dash uh, for its arguments, dash no profile, dash encoded command. Red serve uses forward slash. However, you can change it. And a lot of binaries will support both dashes and slashes. So again, any time I'm writing a detection now, I know this is a trick that works for some binaries, so I'm going to test it on the binaries at hand and make sure that I take that into account. And so in this case, I'm taking it into account by having or, so slash s or dash s. You could also use a regular expression if you wanted to. Um, file extensions. So for redserve.exe uh, and scrobj.dll, we can totally remove those and the operating system will find that for us based off of iterating through the path extension environment variable. In addition, the SCT file doesn't have to have any extension at all or it doesn't have to be the SCT file extension. It's based purely on the content of the file itself. So if you're looking only for network connections to a .sct or if you're looking for .sct in the arguments, that can be completely evaded and we see attackers doing this all the time. It's very simple to do. Another thing um, is attackers realize that defenders often will write detections based on process name is reg serve and it contains these arguments. Um, and maybe uh, some people will say, okay, well, I know you can just change reg serve, copy it to another name, but I still want to look for, you know, HTTP slash I, scrobj, blah, blah, blah. Well, attackers can just freaking change both of those. And now rename Casey, uh, uh, reg serve to Casey and actually rename the DLL itself because Red Server is simply looking on the disk for the DLL name that you gave it. So you can rename it to smith.dll, and now scrobj doesn't even appear on the command line or even in image load events. So again, each piece, can we change this on disk? Can we change this in the arguments? And how does that affect our detection? Um, APT32 loves to do this kind of stuff, by the way. We also see them doing this with um, Matt Nelson's C script, um, pubprint.vbs. They like to change that to like ying.exe and yang.txt. So they kind of give us a, a, some good laughs. Um, another thing is if you'll notice when we moved um, the arguments around, before I was assuming that you always had to have a white space on either side of these arguments for the S and the U. But notice we pushed the, um, uh, we pushed the S argument to the very end of the command. Now there's no white space after it. Okay, well that's simple. I just make sure that um, maybe I have some regexes that say only white space um, or it's the end of the command. But what I found is that you can actually put almost any characters you want after a lot of these arguments and that command actually freaking works because red server will ignore text after the argument until the next white space. That sucks, right? Like, I've never seen that in a while before, but again, when I'm going through and saying, okay, my detection assumes that a white space, can I put any character in front of it that works? And then test it, and oh man, this is bad, because it works, and this breaks my detection. Let me go update it. I get happy and sad when I find these things, because it's, I may, I'm happy that I found a new thing that will break my detection, but then it's also work to go and fix it, so I'm kind of my own worst enemy when it comes to that. But when it's all said and done, you feel better about it.
Um, another thing you can do is uh, use double quotes. Um, these are really fine obfuscators, um, and this is where it becomes interesting. Depending on the parent process of a binary, obfuscation characters that work in the parent process sometimes can be passed to the child process. So let's say command is your parent process and red serve is the child. Um, you can actually uh, insert things like double quotes, um, which will be passed down to all subsequent child processes um, the way that the command prompt interprets arguments. Um, and so this now will break the fact that we're looking for dash u or slash u, right? And as long as you keep an even number of pairs of these, you can put them all over the place. Now HTTP isn't even a good indicator. And there's several ways that you can handle this. One is you can do stupid, insane regexes to handle all these special characters, which we do sometimes. Or if you have the capability to do one step of post-processing, you can do before and after analysis to say, okay, if in my command argument, HTTPS is not present, but it is present in the argument once I remove special characters. Now, without one step of post-processing, you can quickly see obfuscation was present without having to do a single regex, which is really nice. So, taking one step back, there's a lot of steps that you can go down um, for obfuscation and evasion, and this is just for a single binary. But a lot of these techniques are applicable for anything on the command line. But it's important to remember there's not a, 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 some magic regex that will detect all these things, or if there is, you probably don't want to spend your time doing that for every single binary uh, and use case that comes out. So break it up into pieces. We have detections for the default arguments with zero obfuscation. That's the plain detection. Then we say, okay, let's handle obfuscation separately. And you know what? Let's handle rename executables and DLLs completely separately as well. And then let's step back and say, what additional context do we have for detections? What about RedServe making these network connections to non-RFC 1918 addresses? Or what about the image load events that happen? What if we see RedServe loading wsham.ocx or JScript DLL or VBScript DLL or all these different things? This is more information telling us what is happening in that process. And then, if we've done all this work to identify these suspicious um, command line arguments, why don't we just do something crazy and say, let me write a snort signature looking for command line host artifacts being transferred over the wire? Which sounds crazy, but you will find some amazing stuff doing this, like SCCM service results being passed over a network where it contains a malicious command, or commands being passed over SMB, or WMI process call create. There's some insanely cool things that happen when you take a high fidelity command argument detection and put it in a network detection with wide open constraints. I don't care what port, I don't care what source or desk. If I see this string, I want to investigate what it is and the context in which I find it. And we find a lot of cool uh, attack techniques based off of finding a known bad thing inside of a wrapper where it's like, whoa, what is this? I, I didn't even know this was possible. Let me investigate now. So first part was red served by XE, but what about detection opportunities for the SCT file? Um, and so again, if we're assuming that this is being hosted remotely, which in most cases it is, so we're gonna look at it mainly from a network perspective, but as before, we wanna look at this and say, how can I better understand this SCT file? Because most attackers are gonna copy and paste. So the first thing that I do for stuff like this is I say, what's common? What is there by default? And if I gather as many samples as I can, as Dunwoody uh, was saying, uh, building a, a corpus, a data set, what are the most common strings I see? Because attackers likely aren't taking the time to figure out what's necessary or what can be changed. So what's highlighted in green are the most common things we see. Um, but then what I wanna ask is, what's actually required? So I go through and piece by piece start removing things to see does this still work. Turns out, you can remove a lot of pieces. Everything in yellow, I mean the comments are kind of a given, but some of the XML tags, prog ID, C data, you can completely remove that. The SCT file still works. So now, I definitely have some detections based on some of those pieces that are removable, but those are the most basic, simple default detections, and I immediately move on to more detections to find like the minimal viable product, if you will, of an SCT file. Next, of the stuff that's here, what can I change? One of the things you might look at is, okay, double quotes and single quotes. We can change those, those are interchangeable, so I should take that into account. Um, also, uh, the class ID. Casey Smith had a fun little joke in here where he ends it with feed ACDC. You would not believe how many people don't change this, and they assume that it's some you know, special uh, you know, class ID that has to stay the same. A lot of people, even some like semi-sufficient or sophisticated attackers will still leave this. So we definitely look for that as a, hey, here's someone who's copy-paste. I wanna know when I see feed ACDC. 
But technically, you can change that um, to anything as long as it's still a valid class ID. So you can change it to something more like that. Um, also, scriptlet tags. This is an SCT file, right? So it must have scriptlet tags, surely. Uh, however, there are other things you can use, like the component tags. And again, this comes down to what's the, what is the minimum required tags required for an SCT file? And I want to make sure I'm using that as my anchor and then looking for everything else. So let's say maybe our anchor is the registration tag and we assume that a scriptlet tag is always required. We can then write a detection looking for things with scriptlet tags or things with registration tags that do not contain a scriptlet tag. And then the first time we see a sample like this being used in the wild or uploaded to VirusTotal, we'll see it and immediately say, wow, someone came up with a cool evasion using component tags. I didn't even know that was possible. And so again, this is one of those kind of reverse detections where we have these really broad detections that we use for collecting new ways attackers are evading certain pieces that we assumed were uh, required but actually weren't. Another thing, for the script language, that can be defined as JScript, uh, and it typically is defined by JScript since, again, that was Casey's example. But you can also use VBScript as well as, and we don't see this often at all, but it's really cool, JScript.encode and VBScript.encode. And if those are used, you're going to have this nice encoded uh, blob inside of the script tags, but it will always start and end with the portions highlighted in green. So now this is very interesting for me because, hey, I wonder how often I would see those two green tags showing up. Uh, even on the process command line, but what about shoved in registry somewhere or again written uh, being passed over the wire uh, via a snort signature or even on disk as a yarder rule. In addition, you could just uh, not describe language at all and uh, JScript is just automatically assumed. So that's convenient. So we don't even have to do that as an attacker. We could also add white space before any um, ending uh, tag in XML, and that works perfectly fine. You can also add it on either side of equal signs when you're setting properties. And then remember what's inside the script tag. You then have XML level obfuscation, which is what we have here, but then you also have language specific obfuscation um, inside of that. And so we definitely do write detections based on the content itself, regardless of if it's wrapped up in an SCT file or maybe an HTA file or some other com scriptlet. Um, but again, a lot of detections I see are written based on ActiveX object open parenthesis or dot run open parenthesis, but you can put white space between all those in JScript and in a lot of languages, um, even including later versions of PowerShell, you can introduce really weird white space and it still interprets correctly. But again, we don't know until we try. And we do a lot of this with some fuzzers that we've written, but a lot of times it comes down to just manually poking and kind of walking through a list of, I've seen this work over here, I wonder if it works in this case, and then trying it iteratively, just like we're doing here. In addition, you can just remove new lines because XML parses nicely, so this is still a valid SCT file that will pop calc, um, just like the original POC. So. We've done all this work now. We've gone through all these iterations. We know more about what's required, what's the minimal viable SCT file. Now we want to put that logic to work in as many places as we can. So we'll look for that in network detections, but we won't re restrict any ports. We think we're only going to see it being downloaded for HTTP, but lo and behold, since we left it open, there's an attacker pushing it over SMB to another system. They already have internal access and are moving laterally, pushing SCT files. So again, depending on the tightness of the detection, I prefer to leave it open to look as many places as I possibly can. And you can also convert this logic from a snort signature into a Yara rule and do things like scan the um, temporary internet files or INET cache, because even though RegServe is fileless, uh, the operating system will freaking download your SCT file and store it in temporary internet files for performance, for caching. So a lot of attackers don't know that, and so we like to look in those places for these SCT files. And in addition, if we already have that converted into Yara, we'll also search things like VirusTotal um, or other sources to look for other uh, SCT files that are being uploaded to get more information on how attackers are evading and changing their payloads. So once again, there is no magic regex. And if there was, it's very inefficient to do so, so we break it into many different detections. What's the default case? How do we handle obfuscation? Uh, do we put this on the endpoint or the network, or both? And how do we go through iterative approaches? And after we've come up with as many known things as we can, let's add one in the front that looks backwards and says, SCT file, that's none of these other things, and that is a feed that we continually look at to say, wow, something new is happening here. What is this cool evasion technique this attacker used? Um, and this is really the kind of approach 
approach that we take every day when it comes to these kinds of detections, both for developing in real time and historical. And again, once we've sunk the time into the detection uh, methodology, we want to translate it to as many languages and detection platforms as we possibly can so that we can get the most benefit out of it. Cool, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, where we get ideas for some of these things and how some of these things fit together. So uh, I, if you're paying attention and you've done hunting before, you might notice that there's some similarities between the methodologies that we're using for our detection development and for hunting. You're, you're forming a hypothesis, you're gathering data, you're walking through this process. Uh, and it is a very similar process, but with a different intent. So we're focusing on defining a detection for evil as opposed to finding the evil directly, but there's a certain amount of synergy between these. So we can hunt to validate detections. When we're doing that false positive test and when we're doing uh, validation of, of indicators, that's basically hunting. And we do find activity uh, in environments where we're operating while we're actually testing indicators even before we push them to be live. And so uh, when we identify those things, we can, can take advantage of that. The other is that we can develop detections based on hunt results. So any time that I uh, am hunting through an environment, one of the outputs for that hunt should be some kind of new detection, whether that's blacklisting something that's evil uh, that was identified during the hunt or whitelisting all of the good things that we found during that hunt uh, and then using that to help to automate that process of uh, identifying that evil. So any time that you're searching for the same things over and over and over again, I uh, should definitely be trying to figure out, is this something that I can automate into a detection? Uh, another great uh, connection between these is that detections that never quite get to the point where they hit that FP target, where they're just a little bit too noisy, hunting is a great place to then apply those techniques because hunting is generally going to have a much higher tolerance for those false positives and is more about data collection than specific uh, item identification. So that is one place where you can still leverage those uh, detections even if they never went into like a live production situation. The other is that we tend to focus on the attack lifecycle, and you can use the cyber kill chain, you can use whatever model you want, but the idea here is that we're going to push our detections beyond that initial compromise into uh, the full attack lifecycle. And some of these kind of act as choke points where there are only so many ways to move laterally in an environment, and when someone comes out with a new one, that's a big deal, right, because it's, it's a finite set. Same with escalating privileges, with maintaining presence, like that persistence aspect. So by enumerating these things and, and finding ways to effectively identify malicious use of them, we can make it a lot harder for attackers to make their way through the full life cycle without tripping over one of our detections somewhere. So even if we have something like Eternal Blue that comes out, maybe we don't have detection for that at the outset, but maybe we have detection for some of the post-compromise activities that actors are going to do using those kinds of exploits. We're also going to look at what's coming out of our active and historic uh, uh, attacker activity from our incident response investigations. And this is really valuable and something that we get a certain amount of unique benefit here from just where we work. But there's a lot of this information that is being published out there. There's a lot of blogs coming out on both attacker TTPs, their specific tools. Um, all this data is getting published every day. So there is a lot out there to keep an eye on. Uh, analyzing malware samples, again, there's a lot of malware out there that you can get your hands on if you really want to look for, whether it's posted up on GitHub or some of these other repos and resources. Um, Intel, so this needs to be that the kind of actionable intel that you can really utilize as opposed to um, you know the, the kind of higher level or the threat feeds for this specific purpose um, open source research whether that's Twitter github vendor blog posts I mean there, there it really is a ton of information out there uh, we get a lot of things off of Twitter because at this point if a red team is doing something attackers are going to do the same thing uh, all of that stuff is getting recycled and then a lot of I wonder how often just I wonder how often this process loads this DRL I wonder how often these processes even get executed or make network connections or whatever and uh, just going out and, and setting up the infrastructure needed to be able to answer those questions for a given environment is, is really Really valuable and especially within a single environment one of the challenges we have is that we operate across a large number of environments so a lot of those assumptions we make about how things should work or, or questions that we have like this um, it's amazing the answers we get back where some environments will just have the craziest things happening due to you know odd tools or strange configurations or legacy support but within a given environment it can be much easier to kind of establish those baselines and be able to make effective detections for those kind of more anomaly based um, approaches and a couple of takeaways to wrap up. So 
uh, really important to know what you're detecting today and how you're detecting it. You know, what are the data sets? What are the tool sets? What, what's the time frame? How long is it going to take between something actually happening and you being aware of it and being able to take action? Uh, knowing the uh, assumptions about attacker techniques and your own visibility. So visibility is going to define what you even have an opportunity to detect uh, and your assumptions about what attackers are going to do and how they're going to operate uh, can definitely impact the effectiveness of any of these kinds of detections um, and capture the results of Hunts' new detections as I mentioned. Uh, know your tools, so validate data sources with more than one tool and, and understand the limitations of those tool sets and the artifacts and where you need to compensate elsewhere. So sometimes you're just not going to have the data that you're looking for from a given tool and it's a matter of do you need to look at other tools? Is there an open source solution to that problem? Do you need to buy something? Do you need to build something uh, in order to fill those gaps where they uh, where they're really critical. And then automate the repetitive tasks. So one of the things that we've gotten a lot of value out of is when we have these questions like I wonder how often, being able to ask those really efficiently and with a minimum amount of manual effort. So we can kind of focus on developing the detections and spend our time working on those methodologies as opposed to doing the legwork of actually going out and collecting data and, and working on this. So automate as much of that as possible and really focus on the, the high value returns. Uh, and that's it. Um, so, you know, we're happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Matthew and Daniel. Um, do we have questions um, in the audience? Back there, one second. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so, uh, how often would you say, guys, is that you find uh, a new obfuscation technique or something new that you find uh, it can bypass your techniques and say, oh, this is something new that we found, we're going to apply it on our rules and systems, and then you see that someone else out there is already using it, and you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, no, that's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> I think I definitely have my favorite groups that impress me <laughs> with their obfuscation. Uh, for me personally, Fin7 okay. and APT32 compete for first place in my heart of the coolest obfuscation. And it's very specific, it's very targeted obfuscation. Um, and, uh, and yeah, again, since we have uh, as best we possibly can uh, many layers of detection, we'll see Fin7 throw a crazy trick out. It's like, whoa! that bypassed a lot of our detections, but we still caught it based on this new anchor. But it, it bypassed enough detections for us to say, we need to go and revisit and see how can we make this better. Um, the stuff that we see Fin7 doing, I don't know that we've necessarily immediately seen other groups doing it, but it definitely will, it, it will, it'll trigger ideas for our own research. Like for example, Fin7 um, last June um, did a really, in my opinion, sexy obfuscation technique with command.exe where it was a character uh, substitution technique using a variable name, colon, and string equals another string. And they were doing that. It was, it was the coolest thing. I didn't even know command could do that. And it got me so excited that I spent the next nine months researching command.exe obfuscation. Um, and that's what all the dosfuscation research is from. So from that research, as I started to then look for the techniques that I was uncovering, we did see some of those being used like in like different like obfuscated um, batch file payload generators. Um, but most of, most of that research we really didn't see being used until, um, weirdly, a tool was released to do that stuff. But, um, but yeah, I, I think there definitely are some cases, maybe for less interesting obfuscation, where we do kind of see one person use it and realize, oh, maybe this is coming from like a, a publicly available builder or something like that. So a lot of times we'll also, you know, search GitHub, Pastebin, and other places to try to find this technique or this uh, uh, syntax and maybe actually find the builder that it came from and realize, hey, this, maybe this is more common than we realized, but we just caught it this one time. We need to go back and kind of retro hunt through our data and see what else um, might be there. And we also, we, we have kind of a standing offer with the community that if there is a new technique or something that they've developed that they're interested, like, is this out there? Is this something that you've seen before? Um, if you contact any of us, I mean, we'll, we'll run that down and basically we'll try to actually look both across the environments that we have access to as well as through all of our intelligence to try to figure out, is this something that has in fact been used by attackers uh, in the past? And there have been instances where that's been the case, where somebody's come up yeah. with something they thought was very novel and was very novel, but it turns out somebody else had thought of it as well. Yep. 
And, and in some cases that, that when we do see, hey, yeah, this actually is being used by some very interesting uh, targeting groups, then maybe that person will say, oh, okay, well maybe I'll delay the release of this and try to figure out a better way to release this technique, um, realizing that, that it's, that it might be used pretty darn quickly and there some other implications there. But, but yeah, it's been really cool to see people reach out and, and share those techniques and we can kind of give back and exchange some of the information we have access to. But excellent question. I'm always open for obfuscation questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One more? This is a very inquisitive side of the room right here. <laughs> uh, excellent talk, guys. Uh, do we also bump into stuff which is not obfuscated? Uh, but still malicious? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, obfuscation, uh, it's a fraction of the total stuff that we see. Yeah. Uh, it tends to be specific applications or specific groups that tend to favor it more than others. Uh, Uh, but since, uh, I mean, especially since like Invoke Obfuscation came out, we've, we've seen that commoditized a little bit more, I'd say, but mm -hmm. it's, it's still a mixed bag. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, for us, we, we also, there's the non-obfuscated stuff, there's the super obfuscated like push button payload stuff, but then we also tend to focus a lot on the middle of very tasteful obfuscation, which again, like Fin7 and APT32 are really good at because that that tells us this wasn't just a script kitty hitting a button. This was someone who very specifically looked at a, uh, at a, a command and then said, I see that all the detections out there are detecting based off of these things in this order. I'm going to change that. There's, I forget who, someone tweeted just two or three days ago about the cert util um, uh, downloader syntax that, oh, strange enough, also Casey Smith found where you can basically have cert util download payloads using cert util dash uh, URL cache dash split. And they said, hey, Defender detects on this, but if I literally just swap those, it doesn't. Um, and, and so again, like looking for very specific things like that is, is quite interesting for us as well. Yeah, that's always going to be the best obfuscation because if you, if you hammer it, it becomes very obvious that yeah. this is something that somebody didn't want you to, to look at too closely. But if it's something that's a lot more discreet, it can get past like the obfuscation detection type things. It can like be a lot harder to, to pick out as, as like very loudly malicious. And, and there actually is one project that I know of based on like this minimal obfuscation technique for PowerShell at least. So Ryan Cobb, uh, who now works at SpectreOps, um, last year, actually almost a year ago, um, to the day he released a tool called uh, PSAMZ or PSAMSI for the anti-malware scan interface. And basically it takes PowerShell obfuscation and then applies it very selectively. It basically breaks out the whole script and given an a, a certain AV signature that uses AMSI to detect this script is malicious, it says let me break out the whole script into the whole tree and find only the components that are triggering the alert and then obfuscate just those components. It's really cool because now the whole script is like barely obfuscated but it's obfuscated in every freaking right place depending on that signature. So there's some really cool uh, work in the community for that sort of thing. Um, but it just means that we kind of shift and say, all right, well, how can we, um, how can we write detections based on individual components of this abstract syntax tree? And it, it, it's a really fun cat and mouse game. Well, it, fun is relative, I, I suppose, but, um, but yeah, there's definitely some cool work in that area. But awesome question. Cool. Well, we're between you guys and lunch, so, uh, so thank you again for your time. And if you have any questions, we'd love to chat and say hello outside, but thank you very much.